pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, this evening is our organizational meeting, and so we will begin with the official oath of office. At this time, I would like Gary Dunlap, Tom Cruz, student representative Alex Ockrey, and myself, we're gonna go forward to have the um, oath of office administered by Kate Mayer, our clerk. Great. With that having been completed, if Mrs. Mayor, if you would do the roll call, please. I will. Kate Mayer, I'm here. Tim Menneker? Here. Lisa Collins? Here. Gary Dunlap? Here. Cheryl Hancock? Here. Anita Jagosinski? Here. Tom Cruz? Here. Alex Akra? Here. Okay. With seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Um, approval of the agenda. I, had no, I would note that the agenda has been amended and posted and distributed to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda? Any additional changes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Board organization, election of the temporary chair. Our first official duty this evening is to appoint a ch temporary chair to conduct the board of officers election. I would entertain a motion to appoint a t temporary chair for the board of op board officers election. I'll make a motion to um, appoint Cheryl Hancock as the temporary chair. Is there a second? second? Second. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Okay, motion has been made and seconded to appoint Cheryl Hancock as the temporary chair for the Board of Officers um, elections. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Okay. I would note that a nomination needs to be made and seconded it does not require uh, does not require a vote as far as, as for the by ben, by ben. okay because it would if there's only one nomination then it wouldn't right. we wouldn't require a ballot vote but that you do have the option for all of these positions to make a motion to what is how is that called cast a unanimous, cast a unanimous ballot for the individual if there is only one individual, and that helps to speed things up. So, I would entertain a motion, or I would 
Are there any <laughs> nominations? Sorry, are there any nominations for the office of president? Again, being redundant, I will nominate Cheryl Hancock uh, as school board president. Are there? Is there a second? A second. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to cast a unanimous ballot. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Vice President, are there any nominations for the office of Vice President? I would like to nominate Anita Jagosinski. Is there a second? I'll second. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? And last time, are there any other nominations? If not, I would entertain a motion to cast a unanimous ballot to elect Anita. Is there a motion? A motion. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. Was that Gary? Yes, yes, it was. And Kate, you seconded? I'll second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of casting unanimous ballot to elect Anita Jagosinski as vice president, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Clerk, are there any nominations for the office of clerk? I will nominate Kate Mayer as board clerk. Is there a second? A second. Are there any other, thank you, Lisa. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to cast a unanimous ballot and elect Kate Mayer as clerk. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Treasurer, are there any nominations for the office of treasurer? I'd like to uh, nominate Lisa Collins. Is there a second? A second. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to cast a unanimous ballot and elect Lisa Collins as treasurer. I so move. There's a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of electing Lisa Collins as treasurer, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then, the elected officers may assume their positions. And we're fine, I think, with it the way we are this evening, or? Gary's packing up already. <laughs> I'm, packing. <laughs> ready to go. I'm packing, man. He is ready to move. That so, means you get to sit move. next to me, Gary. Yeah. Come up here. Uh, that didn't last very long. Wow. Yeah, that didn't last very long. I told you that wasn't your plug. And if we could, I'm going to ask Ben Miller to come forward so we can continue as they're moving their spots. Um, continue on designation of the official depositories. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Here to talk to you tonight about the designation of official de depositories for investments and checking services. You may recall that a year ago, uh, a full bid process was conducted to uh, review the investment and checking services for the district. And uh, at that time, we um, selected Merchants Bank uh, for checking services. And then for the uh, investment services, it was Merchants Bank along with the State of Wisconsin Local Government Investment Pool, which is the fund that uh, state um, uh, deposits for the tax dollars come into and then are distributed into other accounts. Park Bank, Associated Trust Bank, uh, Trust Company. And at this time, uh, we're requesting that uh, there be no change to the official depositories. Everything's uh, going well with those um, organizations and we see no, no reason to make a change at this time. Okay, are there any questions? Then I would entertain a motion to approve Merchants Bank 
LGIP Park Bank and Associated Trust Company as the district's investment depositories and continue checking services with the Mer Merchants Bank. Is there a motion? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. You're kind of quiet now. Um, any discussion or questions? Okay, then a motion has been made and seconded to designate Merchants, approve Merchants Bank, LGIP, Park Bank, and Associated Trust Company as the district's investment depositories and continue checking services with Merchants Bank NA. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. If the record could show that I abstained from any action on that. Yes, thank you, Christina. Designation of official newspaper, Dr. Carlson. You would have a recommendation <clears throat> that we continue to designate the Onalaska Home and Courier Life as the official newspaper for the school district. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve designating the Onalaska Home and Courier Life as the official newspaper for the district. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Okay, all those, there's a motion has been made and seconded to designate the Holman on Alaska Courier Life as the official newspaper for the district. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. W, Wisconsin Interscholastic Association membership. Dr. Carlson. Again, you have a recommendation that we continue as a school district our membership in the WIAA. And if you have questions, be happy to respond. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve the 2014-2015 WIAA membership for the district activities. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay, motion carries. Wisconsin Association of School Board Membership, Dr. Carlson. Yes, uh, continuing the recommendation that the board uh, maintains its membership in your organization, the state organization, Wisconsin Association of School Boards. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve the district's 2014-2015 Wisconsin Association of School Board membership as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then the next item is the Wisconsin Association of School Board Representatives. Dr. Carlson? Well, you would be um, looking for a nomination as far as appointment of a, a member of the board to serve as your representative at the upcoming convention, annual convention in January. So, and I would entertain a motion to appoint an, a board member as a WASB representative. I'd like to nominate Lisa Collins. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Any other board members interested? I am. Oh, Tom. Yes. Um, and you attended the last WASB last week, didn't you, the new board? So, would we do it the same way as board officers then? If you to want if to, you, you can do that. Okay. Uh, this is uh, as far as a motion to appoint. Okay. You can open it up if you want. So, are there other nominations for the Wisconsin Association of School Board Representatives? Any other nominations? I think we would do a ballot is what we would get to. The question was asked if we would do a ballot. And the last time, any other nominations? Then the motion, I would entertain a motion to elect Lisa Collins, unanimously elect Lisa Collins. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor of electing Lisa Collins as the Wisconsin Association of School Board Representative for the district. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 
motion carries and Tom it's good to know that you're interested so we'll have to keep that in in mind the next item is designation of CESA for representative and I think last year was that Kate yeah Mm -hmm. um, the representative for CESA for Dr. Carlson, did you want to address that? Again, if you want to just deal with the same way, if there's interest, you might want to solicit interest first yeah. and then go from there. But the CESA for their <laughs> main responsibility is attend the summer meeting at on June 4th of 2014. Correct. Thank you. So is there anyone who might be interested? Maybe we'll, I'm sorry, I should have done that last time. I'm interested. Anyone else that might be interested? I wasn't paying attention, sorry. Oh, it's the CESA 4. When is that again? June 4th of 2014, in the evening. I, don't, I, I think I'm busy. I'm sorry. So I would then entertain a motion to appoint one of your board members as the CESA 4 representative. Would someone? I'll make a motion to um, uh, nominate Kate Mayer, appoint Kate Mayer. I'll Kate. second it. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. So a motion has been made and seconded to appoint Kate Mayer as the CESA 4 representative. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Designation of school board meeting times and dates. Dr. Carlson? You have in your packet, again, a calendar <clears throat> that would outline, again, your regular board meeting dates. And these would be, again, at 7 p.m. Other unless it's noted differently. And so we have um, put something out actually starting with tonight, but and carrying it all the way through the next calendar year. And um, so this would be something looking for you to approve, and, but you also always have the option to alter this as needed. And again, this is as we know it right now, the calendar mainly made up of our regular board meetings, and not to include special board meetings at this time. So the motion would be made to approve the second and fourth Mondays at 7 o'clock p.m. as our regular board meeting times. Correct. So I would entertain a motion to approve the second and fourth Mondays at 7 o'clock p.m. as our regular board meeting times and dates. I so move. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Gary, any discussion? I just would note, I think traditionally December and May, we have a little flexation with the, the meeting time because of Christmas and because of Memorial Weekend. So. so a motion has been made and seconded to approve the second and fourth Mondays at seven o'clock as a regular board meeting days and time. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. So then we move on to our board norms reflection. We did have a meeting um, last week, a workshop meeting, and we talked a little bit about our board <coughs> norms that we adopted a, a couple months ago. And if you look inside your blue folder, the norms are all listed there. If anyone has any questions or comments on those, just a reminder to reflect on those as we uh, move about the rest of our meeting tonight. So. Next, we'll move on to public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. So if you'd come forward to the microphones over here, um, if anyone wants to address the group, or maybe you're here to listen to the discussion, which is later on on the agenda. So, but if you wanna, um, this is your opportunity to address the board with any concerns you may have. Sure, come on forward. If you want to just have a seat here, sorry. <laughs> You're being televised to thousands of residents throughout the oh, district, so we want to make sure to capture your picture. I know. I mean, Wonderful. Like, Stop Thank it. you. Um, I, my name is Chad Monty. I live at 1009 Eastwood Street, and uh, I'm here along with a lot of other parents. Um, my son is in the second grade at, uh, at Evergreen and uh, is getting a wonderful uh, education there. Uh, going into the third grade, we've found out that the uh, plan is 
to have two third grade classes going down from three classes that are now in second grade to two classes in the third grade. Uh, currently, there's approximately 20 students per class in the uh, three classes in second grade. And making the move to, as we understand, two teachers in uh, the third grade is to us represents a 50% increase in the amount of students per teacher. And you, you, you know, the numbers can speak for themselves at that. You have, uh, you know, you, 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 you're, you're, you're taking away the quality of the education that they're currently getting uh, as far as uh, pupil to teacher ratio. And uh, we're all very concerned about that. And we, you know, we want to make, we want to make, we, we hopefully we will consider that to have three classes for uh, next year's third grade class. Uh, I don't know why, we don't know the rationale why, at least I don't. Uh, I'm just very concerned as a parent that I want my, that's why we came here to Holman. One of the reasons is why we wanted to get a quality education, and we know that Holman has a quality school system. So uh, with that being said, I, there may be some other parents that here that have the same concerns. So I'll leave my time to them. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? We promise we won't bite. <laughs> this one. Um, I'm Lisa Phillips, and I have oh 810 Case Court in Holman, and I have um, I will have three girls attending Evergreen next year. Right now, I have two, and ag again, uh, kind of concerning the same topic of decreasing the third grade teacher staff at Evergreen next year from three to two has me concerned. Um, you know, you're limiting the face time of teacher to student by, you know, you're dropping it by a third. Um, unfortunately, this came to me at a time when I wasn't able to pull together a lot of research, but um, as far as what the district has as a mission statement, I'm just wondering how decisions like this are made um, to decrease, if it's something that we as parents need to be, be concerned with every year. Uh, from here on out, if this is something that you're considering with this grade or this particular class moving forward, are we going to have to revisit this every year? Um, I know the district policy is a 30 student. Um, my understanding is it's a 30 student maximum per teacher, and I'm, I'm, it just has me concerned enough, in particular with this group who I have followed in volunteering every week through, through the whole time that this particular child has been at Evergreen. and. It's an active group that has a lot of needs, and I think it's a real disservice to the kids if we put them in a position of limiting um, interaction with teachers. And that's it. Thank you, Lisa. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Uh, my name is Shannon Schneider. I live at 1000 Greenwood Street in Holman. Um, I have three kids at Evergreen as well, and one uh, who will be in third grade next year. So I'm just, I echo the concerns of the parents that are here. Um, I think the research that I have done along is just being in the classroom um, from time to time, as well as just looking at the research, everything points to smaller class sizes benefit the students. Um, everything from the capability of their learning to, you know, students with special needs and actual physical room in the classroom. Right now, the classrooms, if you try and add another 10 desks in there, I'm not really sure how that would work. And if you have um, students with special needs and wheelchair access and that type of thing, I'm not really sure how you're going to facilitate that. But then secondly, when you look at the long-range progress of a child in school, all of the evidence points to K through three being in smaller classroom sizes, establishes the foundation for ed their learning um, further on down the line. So I guess those are my biggest concerns. Um, I think the information also points out that teachers that have to be in classrooms with that size spend more time managing students than actually being able to teach them. 
So. Okay. Thank you, Shan. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Right. Again, I'm Rebecca Blank and 7440 Casper Cooley Road. I again spoke at the last meeting. I've talked to my husband about it. We voiced the same concerns um, with the decrease in class size. As previously mentioned, I talked to my kids. They were concerned. But I've also been through a tremendous amount of education myself, as many of you also have. And I'm sure as you know that when we go up in our education to make the best students possible, we reduce the number in our classes. And I know when I was in grad school out of state in Kalamazoo, when I started my first year in grad school, there were six in my class. By the end, there was one, one-on-one -on -one with a physician. The goal was not to put out the most students. It was to put out the best. To make the best, we have to establish study habits. We cannot let our kids get lost. And we're going to lose them if we decrease the number of teachers and increase the class size. So again, I don't know where this is coming from, but as a parent, I feel like we have a right to know. And with that, we can make decisions and we can be involved. Because that's a big reason I came to Holman, because it was one of the best. And if it continues as such, then we're thrilled. But if there are changes that are looking to be made, then we, we can't support that. So thank you for your time again. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? I would just share with you that the practice of the board is not to respond to specific questions or have a discussion of the issues that are brought to us under public participation. Oftentimes, um, those items are not on our agenda to be discussed, so we may not have the answers that you're looking for. However, we do have a staffing report later on on the agenda, so if you want to stay and listen um, to that, it's under item 12.4. Dr. Carlson may be able to answer um, some of the questions that were posed this evening for you. So I encourage you to maybe stay and listen firsthand. So um, having done that, if there's, we'll give it one last call for someone to come forward. Oh. My name is Christy Schrader, 311 Mallard Drive. and. Uh, I'm also concerned. I'm not here to disagree with any of the parents here, but I think the number of parents and teachers and other staffing that have showed up in the two meetings, I think that speaks volumes. I really do think it speaks volumes to how we really feel about this. And I, I hope you don't mind, but I took something off of your website. <laughs> um, as we manage the district's continued growth, collaborate and partner with vital stakeholders. I hope you will join us in our pursuit to become a premier district of choice where every student achieves. If I'm a parent coming into a new school district, and uh, I actually did this when my kids were coming here, classroom size is one of many factors to consider when you're choosing or evaluating a school. I really feel if we're gonna be premier we need to keep our classrooms small. We need to give our students the best chance they possibly can have. I'm gonna leave it with that. I think the front of your website says it all. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. So one last time, one last call. Otherwise, we'll move on then to recognition and thank you, Dr. Carlson. Well, we're going to begin this evening. We have Mr. Colin Trivett with us tonight. He was unable to make the last board meeting. And Colin, for those of you that may not be aware, Colin was our, our representative, our student board representative for the past year. 
And so at this time, I'm going to ask Cullen to come up front, and Mrs. Hancock will go around and present you with a certificate of appreciation, Colin, from the board. And again, Colin, thank you so much for your year of service. Just a small token of our appreciation for all the service, and we really appreciated your willingness to speak up as a young person and share um, what was going on in the high school and across the district and your participation in meetings. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Colin, before you go, what are, your, what are your plans for after high school? Where are you going? What are you doing? Oh. Oh. Okay. Well, best wishes, and we will yeah. see you on the stage at graduation. At the senior banquet. Yep, sure. there too. There too. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Colin. Also tonight, just want to recognize all our employees as we move into the month of May. This is the time of year where um, even nationally, we join school districts across the country. Uh, there are even specific weeks that are recognized for employees, but here we try to recognize um, everybody that uh, plays such a crucial role in what we do. I just want to make note that in the month of May, May 5 through 9, there are some special recognitions throughout the country for uh, recognizing National Teacher Appreciation Week and also National School Nurses Week. And again, we add those to uh, recognizing all our employees and thank them for so much. They are, uh, in many ways, what makes our district what it is, and as well as the support of our parents and community. So again, just to, um, we'll be, I know there'll be different uh, recognitions coming up in the next couple of weeks um, and at the building and department levels as well to recognize our employees. And that's it. Okay, thank you. thank you. And as we often say, it's because of individuals like Cullen and our staff and our stakeholders who are either here in the audience this evening, those people who donate to us on a regular basis or they come and they see a need and they are willing to, to meet the need for us. That's really what makes Holman different and I think draws a lot of people to us. And so we do thank all of you for your participation um, in our district. District Administrator's Report, District Administrator um, Report, mm -hmm. Status Report Summary, Dr. Carlson. The only thing I'm going to actually add here, just bring attention to the personnel report this evening, so in addition to my written report, but on the personnel report, we have again a few retirement notifications that the board will be asked to act on. Uh, Virginia Cates, who will be, is in her 22nd year serving the school district as an educational assistant as well as Myra Sheets. I believe we're at 17 years as an educational assistant. So please note that and we thank both uh, so much for the many years of service to the, to the children and families of our school district. So uh, unless you have questions, Russell Report, I just want to make special note of those two retirement notices. Any questions? Okay, then moving on to reports and discussion. Viking Elementary School Elevator Equipment Replacement Bid. Dr. Carls, or I see John Daly coming forward. Yeah, please. Good evening. Um, I'm here to present a bid um, to replace the elevator um, Power unit at Viking Elementary. It logged out on me. Can you? Um, and uh, we'll present that at this meeting, and we'll ask you to approve this at the May 12th board meeting. Thank you. There we go. There. Just wanted to get that spring-like picture up so everybody could see it. Um, although the, although um, there's more to this power unit than the picture you're seeing here, it must be noted this elevator is 40 years old. 
Our elevator companies have recommended because of its age, the power unit, and some maintenance be done at el on the elevator to ensure <coughs> continued uninterrupted service. We have students and staff with physical limitations who depend on this elevator, and this work will minimize the risk of breakdown. The, just a list of some of the specifications that was in the, the uh, formal bid, um, including the power units and fittings, hydraulic oil valves, packing. Here's the bid tabulation. Uh, we went through, a, as I said, a formal bid process on this, including advertising for bids and sealed bids. We received two bids. Uh, we worked both with both Schindler and Braun, both of whom bid on this project. You can see Braun uh, had a bid of $14,199. Um, here's a copy of the issue paper. This project is included in this year's Buildings and Grounds Projects budget. budget um, uh, to be paid for through the general fund. And that's the quick and down and dirty presentation for this. And again, we'll be asking you to make a, um, take action on this next, in two weeks. Are any there questions? any questions? Thank you, John. Thank you. Then monthly expense report overview, Mr. Miller. suggested that we uh, bring uh, bring in uh, some information to the board to talk about the uh, monthly expense report information and revenue reports that you receive each month uh, not only for the new board members but also as a refresher for uh, um, those who have been on the board for some time get it to work here um, a lot of the public may not know but there's uh, a lot of reports that the board members receive each each uh, every two weeks every meeting and um, a batch of those have to do with the uh, financial reporting of the district. And so these are examples of ones that they, that they see. So we're going to talk a little bit about why uh, you get those reports, what, uh, what their purpose is, how to use them, uh, what do they include. First of all, the, the why, there is a, a board policy that says the board shall receive monthly financial statements showing financial condition of the district as of the last day of the preceding month. It also says that uh, such statement will reflect receipts and expenditures by fund. So we'll get into a little bit about the how, and, and I'll, I'll go through this somewhat quickly. I know that accounting isn't uh, at the top of everyone's list to look at, but I, I do think it's, there's some, some very valuable and, and useful information here that, uh, uh, that you'll want to um, be aware of. The first thing to be aware of is that in the uh, issue paper that you receive, uh, it does list the process that goes through before any uh, expense or revenue reaches you. Uh, you need to be aware that uh, budget authorities do a series of steps and reviews before any bill is submitted or any revenue is received. And, and uh, it also goes to the business office and there's a, there's a number of verifications that are done before it reaches you. The other um, policy that I wanted to point out was the board, school board places the responsibility for administrating the budget with the district administrator. So the point of those two slides is that um, while your uh, review is, is I, I would say, a, a common sense review of, of representing the public, um, you don't have to be concerned with micro-reviewing every, every detail of, of those because we go through uh, quite extensive review before they come uh, before you. I'm going to just talk about, uh, quickly go through the different types of reports that you receive. There are two categories, uh, detail listings and summary listings. Uh, the first uh, detail listing that I'll show is on receipts. Um, and you'll see in here, it's kind of hard to see, but you'll see the word re uh, receipt right within the title if you're looking for that. Third one down on the list. And it looks a lot like maybe your home checkbook. Uh, there's similar information, the name, the description, the amount, and the transaction date, and receipt number. Pretty straightforward. The next type of uh, listing is a check listing. Also listed there, uh, you can see it's called checklisting. Pretty easy to identify. Similar again to maybe your checkbook, uh, the vendor, who, what it's for, check number and, and amount. The next type of expenditure report is the BMO credit card report. 
and that's also identified on, on the list by name. And that again lists uh, all the pertinent information about uh, credit card transactions. Then we get into the summary of uh, revenue and uh, you'll see that it, it shows uh, budgeted versus actual. There's a, we start out with a current year listing, and then we'll move into prior year comparisons. But for the current year, um, this is under, it's kind of hard to see, but it's, uh, can't, oh, there we go. It's the last one. It's, it's kind of abbreviated EXP for expense or expenditure. That's how you identify that. Um, the first report that you'll get is a revenue report, and this is different than the detail in that it groups uh, revenues, uh, in this case, by different categories. And these categories are set up by the state of Wisconsin, the DPI, and um, you'll see in this case categorical aids and so forth. Um, in most of these reports, you'll see a couple uh, columns repeating, <coughs> one being the, uh, I think you can see that, uh, the budget amount for the year, this is the current year, and the current year activity. And then the third uh, column I wanna point out is a percentage of activity compared to budget. So in this case, it's 61% is this number divided by that. It shows the unreceived portion and then the current, current month amount. You'll also notice that there's a fund number and um, there's uh, sp special uh, categories of funds as set by the state. I'm just gonna go through a couple of those. The main category is the general fund, which is the, the main operating fund of the district. There's also a special revenue trust or, or a gift fund. There are special education funds that's required to be uh, separated out in, in separate funds. There's a debt service fund for repayment of bonds. Food service fund, cafeteria food service obviously. The, and then uh, for in primarily scholarships, uh, private purpose trust funds. So again, there's the report for re uh, revenues. Move into expenditures. The first report is a current budgeted versus actual. And again, it's the same uh, report uh, as what I said before. It's, we're, in this, we're still in the same one. Um, this is the um, BOE expense report. And I think I may have said expense before, but I was ahead of myself. That was actually the revenue report. So this is, um, this is what you'll see. You'll recognize this report as the expenditures. It's, it's quite a long report, so I'm gonna just break it into pieces. Um, the first page on there lists, um, it's a reference sheet. First of all, it tells you those funds that I just went over, um, fund 10 through 72. Then it breaks it into what they call objects, and that's, that's what you might think of as the what. What is it that we're spending? And those are somewhat more broad categories. And then you get into functions, which is another, describes uh, but to a greater detail. And um, uh, we'll go into a little bit of uh, description on that uh, later. Uh, it will also give a, uh, the detailed description of, of what the category is. So the first um, one that I wanted to show you was the uh, current reporting of expenditures. It's a little bit hard to see, but uh, uh, what it basically is showing is, is um, by fund and by this function category, these are the, the main categories of expenses uh, that the district is, is spending. And so um, again, the sim similar categories, uh, budgeted amount, fiscal year activity, and the percent compared to budget has a new term uh, that you may not have heard of, encumbered, which is, uh, if you want to think of as encumbered, as uh, purchases that are in process, like with purchase orders. And so the unencumbered is what's left to spend out of the year. And then like the other reports, it shows the current, current month activity. The next category, uh, there are a series of pr current versus prior year, so you can compare how this year is, um, is, is panning out versus prior years. And there are three multiple year reports. Uh, the first one is by object, which I mentioned, that's the broad <coughs> category. Then the, and that, that groups all the funds together by object. The second report is fund and object, so it breaks it down by fund then, and then object. Then the third report is the most uh, drilling down fund uh, function and object and that the function area gives a little more uh, detail on what has been spent. And again, I'm um, going to look at that expenditure budgeted versus actual current and prior years. Um, this is the, sorry, that's a repeat there. Oh, yeah. Yep, thank you. 
go the right way there. Okay, now we're into the uh, multi-year report. Uh, that is report number one, which is by object. And um, similar information, except this uh, gives, you can see it's 10, 11, 11, 12 for the years, 2012, 13, and 13, 14. For the current year, you see the revised and the activity. So what's nice about this is you can see, for example, salaries, how um, the district has changed over the years in uh, salary expenses, for example. Benefits. It breaks it down into the main categories here. So this is the multi-year report one. This is multi-year report two, and you can see the title at the top and differentiate. This is, again, it's broken down between salaries, employee benefits, but this one breaks it down by fund. You can see same information, but just broken out uh, by fund. Third report is um, the most detailed report. This now breaks it down into uh, fund and then each uh, function category. So you can see uh, this particular grouping is uh, undifferentiated curriculum, and it breaks that further down into all those, all those various categories, and then continues on to all the other <coughs> function categories and all the other fund categories. So that report is the longest. It's about a six-page report. But if you want to go to that level of detail, uh, that's a very good report to, to. So with that, um, Mr. Clark, did you have anything to add? Or well, only if there are that? questions. I think most people have had about as much as they can take tonight on <laughs> budget reports. I tried to be quick. Yes. Thank you. Beth. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a good, good summary of what we're looking at. Okay. Then I need to get out of this. Oh. The next is the WKCE results. Andy? Well, good evening. Thank you for having me again to share our WKC information. I know I, that I sent you brief information when the results first became available. So just a reminder that WKCE is an important part of our balanced assessment system, but it is not the only assessment that we use, either formatively to inform our instruction or as a benchmark assessment to benchmark how are we doing towards achieving our summative assessments. Our state requires a WKCE. It is given in grades 3 through 8 and in 10. In 4, 8, and 10, they have, in addition to the reading and math, they have language arts, science, social studies, and writing. <clears throat> Two years ago, with the No Child Left Behind waiver, the expectations for our students increased, so we did see that decrease in the percentage of students that were advanced and proficient. We also know that this year is our last year of the WKCE for reading and math. We will still give it, though, next year in the areas of science and social studies because that is a requirement for our state law. So our reading results, this just shows overall as a district, the past three years we have had a positive trend in our students that are scoring advanced and proficient. And as always, here's our MVC comparison. The red line is the state average, and it compares how we are doing with our neighbors, which you'll see we're very close to on Alaska and doing quite well compared to the other schools in the district. One piece of information when you look at all district that you do not see, the percentage of students advanced and proficient in five of our grade levels was the highest in the MVC, and those grade levels were in three, four, six, seven, and eight. So quite a celebration. And as we go down our PDSA <coughs> journey, this is our PDSA goal for the district. And you will see the top for each grade level is the percentage advanced and proficient. 
and then the red is where we actually were for the grade level and the next one below it is where we were compared to the state and you will see the black letters in in there shows where we're either below the PDSA goal which you will see that in grades five and six and interesting if you remember what I just said you know we were the highest in the MVC in grade six but we did not make our PDSA goal so you know we're still doing well even though we did not make that goal and for grade 10 we were below the state average but made quite significant gains from the prior year. If we look at math, you'll notice a five-year positive trend. So that again is wonderful news and a celebration for our district. And here is our MBC comparison. So the red line again is the state average, which we are pretty well above. and. But when we look at where we are in comparison to on Alaska, we're quite a bit below them yet, but we are above the other three districts in the MVC. And this is in comparison to our math PDSA goal. Again, you will see that we, in all levels, were above the state average, but below in fifth, sixth, and 10th grade. So this is our results for language arts. Again, only tested in grades 4, 8, and 10. We were above the state average in all of the grade levels. In grade 4, the state average, just to give you an idea, is 76.1% advanced and proficient. Grade 8 is 63.3% advanced and proficient, and grade 10, 70.8% advanced and proficient. So again, quite a bit above the average. And when looking at the state average as a whole in our district, we are in the MVC, we are above the state average and number one in the MVC for language arts. And now our science information. Again, in grades four and eight, we were above the state average. The state average for grade four was 77.4% advanced and proficient. Grade eight, 77.3% advanced and proficient. But we were below the state average in science for grade 10, which is 77.5% oh, advanced and proficient. But in the MVC and the state average as a whole, the district was <coughs> above and also number one in the MVC for science. <coughs> Social studies, amazing scores. We were above the state average in all areas. It, the state average for fourth grade was 91.8% advanced and proficient. In eighth grade, 80.3% advanced and proficient. And 10th grade, 76.6% advanced proficient was the state average. In comparison with the MVC, we are in second place to on Alaska, but still doing a great job, well above the state average. So what does this mean for our district? Well, our PDSA teams are starting to plan for the data retreat, which is when Matthew will be here in June. I know the district level PDSA teams, we've been meeting and looking at the WKCE data quite thoroughly and deeper than even what I've shared here. Um, so within there, we're looking at really around our four PLC questions again. What, what do all students need to know, understand, and do? And looking closely at language arts, math, and disciplinary literacy. 
Also, continuing to align learning targets, instruction, and assessments so that we are able to monitor our kids through that balanced assessment system to determine how are we doing and ensuring that all students achieve at high levels. And then today our RTI, our elementary RTI committee met all day to really talk about our systems for intervention for our kids who are struggling. So continuing to work on how do we meet all students' needs and make sure that more are achieving that advanced and proficient rate. Any questions? Okay, are there any questions? <laughs> No, no questions. I have a, Ooh, I have a question. When you're choosing, can you speak into the microphone? Sorry. Does the state say which grades to test? Yes. The four, eight, and ten, and yeah. so they set the guideline for that. Yes, or? they do. Yes, they do set it. So, the guidelines for that are when they test for the science and social studies and that state law. Okay. So. Other questions. I have another question. Sure. Are you at all concerned about the um, below state average rankings? I mean, oh, definitely. We're definitely looking at that, and looking to, we're looking at you know not only trends within the district, but then also at grade levels and thinking about how can we meet those needs better. It, it sounded like there was improvement. You mentioned in some of the areas the year prior. However, still kind of below state average, but we're increasing our The only one that we were below state average was science in 10th grade and then reading in 10th grade. Otherwise, we were above state average in, in all areas. What kind of interventions do we do for those in those? Because I know that we take the tests in the fall mm -hmm. and then the results came back. I think they were back a couple six weeks, weeks ago, ago yeah. four, you know, four or five weeks ago. And so then in order to assist the students in 10th grade, I mean, they still have two years in high school in order to. Oh, most, most definitely. So you know, today was more the elementary meeting, but I know with the high school team, we've been looking at different structures. I know this year they, they started a new skinny for all ninth graders for their algebra and for the language arts so that they would be able to have a support class at the same time that they're having that but continuing to search for ways to help all students achieve so does that answer your question it does i have one question yes you mentioned on alaska was better in a couple different areas Anything mm -hmm. that blaringly stands out why they do better than we do in those areas? I mean, like start times or class times or teacher teacher um, length and service, anything like that? I just was curious. Yeah. You know, we're looking at a lot of things, and those are like start time we haven't investigated, but that is something that I can bring back to the team to talk more about. But that is something I know we have a very good relationship with on Alaska, so we talk quite regularly about what we're doing the same and what we're doing different. I know when I speak with Roger, he's really wondering what we do at the elementary levels that our scores are outperforming them so well. So I mean, we have those conversations quite often. I have a, I have a question too that I just mm -hmm. thought of. Um, in terms of looking at maybe let's say the past three years, and I know the test will change and it has changed, but is there ever a way that, I believe that in school districts, we can track the history of individual children to see mm -hmm. how they're doing. I know that we can do that, but I'm always curious, like when I see, let's take a fifth grade that, um, I'll just pick a random grade, let's say it's a second grade, that didn't meet goal or maybe it's below state. Is there ever a report that could be put together so that we could see what that looked like last year? So you know where I'm going with this is yep, like following this the year's, cohort data, yes. Yeah, this year's fifth grade, have has it always been that way? And and is that it could be yeah. for a myriad of reasons, but are there reports like that available? There are ones our PDSA team 
has for all of our different assessments that we look over time. We look at the cohort data. We also look at the grade level data. So we're looking at more than, so you know, when you look at grade level data, you're more comparing apples to oranges because they're different children, but yes. looking at how are they progressing. And yes, we do look at that. It's a huge part of our PDSA, which Kate, if you want to see any time, I can share with you. Okay. <coughs> Lisa? I have, I have a question. On the data retreats, mm -hmm. can you tell me, I don't know a whole lot about, I don't know how much of the rest of the board knows about the data retreats and how they drive future focus on what you need to be looking at. Can you tell mm -hmm. us how that works? So when, you know, we're just in the planning stages with Matthew, but when we come together, the first day is more the district level PDSAs or the district level PDSA teams get together. They look at data, they analyze data, and look at and re-look at our goals for the year or for the following year and start you know, getting to the root cause and starting to action plan what are we going to do in, in the next months. And we get together, at, you know, with our PDSAs, for example, my team for each of the three PDSAs, we get together once a month for a half day to really look at our data, look at our action steps, how are we doing in achieving and our action steps, do we need to change any? So it's it's really a living, breathing document. It's not anything that sits on a shelf for us because we're always looking at what can we do better. Does that help? And then as we look at it, um, the data retreat is uh, not only have we had our district level, but then at oh, the building yes, level. Yes, the building level after that. So thank you. So we bring, uh, we have those improvement teams at the building level um, coming together um, and working and this past year, we've, uh, that's part of what we are utilizing Matthew Fail for as well. And Matthew has helped us to um, get back to, again, that, that practice, that discipline practice of using the PDSA process. So, Are you, are you saying that the, the PDSA process is, like there's a district-wide goal, but then there's also building level yes. goals mm -hmm. that are somewhat different? Or, mm. they're, they're very much aligned. Um, a building may have a different PDSA that is an area of need that's not a district one, but as far as the writing and math and RTI type PDSA, they do have building goals, but their, they're, I guess the quantitative part is different than the district because the district, we're looking at all students where they're looking at the students in their building and setting goals based on them. And so when you're talking about PDSA, it's Plan, Do, Study, Act, and that refers to improvement committees for, we've got district-wide improvement committees, but then we also have building-level improvement committees. Yes. And RTI stands for? I'm sorry, acronym city. <laughs> <laughs> Response to intervention. Right. So that's and for so both ends, our struggling learners and our students that are at the other end, the high achieving students. And the four questions? The four questions are, what do we want all students to know and be able to do? How will we know? What will we do if they don't? And what will we do if they already know it? And so those are some of the guiding mm -hmm. principles that we use in those data retreats. Definitely. Um, and, and helping so that we're meeting the needs of students at all levels. Yes. So any other questions? Thank you, good, Thank you. good report. Thank you, Thanks. Wendy. Then moving on to staffing report, Dr. Carlson. here and make sure I find.
<clears throat> I'm just going to bring up the staffing memo first, and then um, that you should have in your board packet. And then I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint, just a second. But it, let me just uh, talk about the staffing memo. It's just a narrative for you that goes through um, the changes that we're looking at, anticipating at this time, early on in the process for next year. And so I will go through that in more detail here. And I apologize, we had this all set up. This happens every once in a while. Okay, thank you. So I wanna share this evening changes as we look ahead to the coming school year in the staffing plan. The board will be asked to consider approval of changes at the May 12th board meeting. So I'm gonna review a few highlights with you as outlined again in that staffing memo. At the early childhood and 4K kindergarten level, this is the many ways the most difficult level to project enrollment in staffing needs. We analyzed trend data at several points on the staffing calendar. And at this time, we are projecting no change in staffing levels from this year to next. But we continue to watch that 4K enrollment as we do every year. And some of you that have been through this in the past know that not only just with 4K, but all our grade levels, especially through elementary, uh, things we will continue to be watching this in the weeks and months to come. At the elementary level, we currently this year have 76 classroom sections throughout our four elementary buildings. Based on the student enrollment numbers from early April, we do not project an increase need in sections. As in the past, there may be a need to adjust the number of classroom sections at a specific grade level in a specific elementary building. But district-wide, at this time, we are forecasting no change. This is based on applying the board, the current guidelines, and utilizing the board guideline formula to help determine when we consider adding a section. However, we have three or four areas where we have a capacity of less than five students before we would need to consider adding a section. Obviously, Evergreen, uh, third grade that you have heard about is in that, in one of those three or four areas. At the same time, we also have two or three areas that currently have very high capacity that we're also watching closely as well. High capacity being that right now, the class size is, is uh, very favorable, very low, reaching to the point that perhaps we need to consider um, um, lessening a section. As in the past, we will delay decisions on adding elementary classroom sections until we are reasonably confident that the projected numbers will be at that level at the start of the school year. Concerns do exist about higher than desired class size averages in a couple of grade levels in a couple of our schools. This is not a new issue for us. It is especially evident when you have only two classroom sections and the suggested enrollment needed in order to increase to three sections. You obviously are aware of the concerns about grade three at Evergreen, where we would experience, based on the guideline formula, uh, class sizes of 29 to 30 students in two sections before it would call for adding a section. 
It has not been unusual for schools to experience class sizes of 27, 28, 29 students at the third, fourth, and fifth grade level. So uh, administrative rule 343.2 is our class size administrative rule. And with that um, is the formula that we have applied for a number of years. And you have guideline numbers that you plug into that formula. And one of the issues that's occurring, and I'll use Evergreen as an example, the guideline number stated in that administrative rule for second grade is 22. And so we use that when we determine number of sections for grade two, we use 22 as that number that we keep putting into that formula. When we move to grade three, that guideline number moves from 22 to 24. And so when you plug that number in, and again, I don't want, and I've said this to people that I have had the opportunity to visit with, early on in this process, we do utilize you know, the, the administrative rule, the guidelines, including the formula that helps um, provide some consistency to the decisions we make. I don't want people to think that we're just so black and white that that's all we consider. But at this stage, that is what is being presented to the board as far as the staffing plan. So right now, we're not projecting a change in enrollment for, from at Evergreen moving from grade two to grade three. I believe right now, 58 or 59 students. But what changes the number of sections is that guideline number moving from 22 to 24. So if the board is considering um, the concerns that you've heard, and again, it wouldn't just be isolated perhaps to the evergreen situation, but if the board would consider at any time a change in the number of sections at any grade level, I would encourage the board to do so through a change in your policy and guidelines and not through making an exception and administration would be ready to assist you in looking at the potential impact to changes if you were to consider making a change within your board administrative rule and guidelines. So I wanted to just elaborate a little bit more than even the comments that I had prepared about the, the, uh, the evergreen situation. And, and again, we might have one or two other cases where, again, right now as we know it, I think everybody in the room, we would say higher than desirable, but I would have to say we've, we've had these issues before. I think even this year we have, um, well, I, I, I know we have a couple grade levels, a couple schools that are higher than I think any of us would say desirable. But our principals and our teachers they make it happen, and um, and let's not forget about them and the outstanding work they do. But I hope that that, um, in a nutshell, abbreviated version of of what how we're uh, ending up with that change in number of sections, even though we're not forecasting a change in the overall enrollment, especially in the Evergreen situation. Dale, did you say you're forecasting 58 or 59 kids in third grade? Yes. So how many kids would need to be enrolled in Evergreen in third grade in order for a third section? You would hit the 30 max um, at the same time. So 30 students. You would hit that. Uh, the formula um, would not um, change that until you hit the 30 students in each classroom. So, so one more. Were, so if there were 60 kids enrolled, si then a section would be technically enrolled. down to the number would be once you hit 61. 61. Because okay. you would keep 30 students, and again, and that's. And can you explain how that yeah. calculation is? Yeah, is, say that again. Please. Sure. If you just give me a moment, I can even bring up the. Sorry, I don't have the board policy. 
if I could just write somehow. <clears throat> Let me see if I can just talk people through this. That's fine, yeah. No. So if you would take, let's take second grade first. 22. Let's just assume um, right now that we have two sections of 22 of, of second grade. So what would you need to increase to three sections? You would take the 22, multiply it times the number of sections you currently have, which is two. Okay? So you have 44. Now if you take that 22 and you take half of that, okay. That's the part I was you have 11. So my math, um, mm -hmm. 44 and 11, so 55. We would be looking at 56 would be when we would consider adding that third section. Okay? Now, if you go to third grade, now let's use 24. So 24 times 2, 48. Now 24, and you take half of 24, you have 12. And so you have 48 and 12 is 60. And, it, and what it really says is more than half. So you'd be looking at 61 is what would drive the next section. So um, in this, in the case, you can use 59 and for both grades. And you can see what happens by using that formula. 59 at the grade two would result in three sections. And then, and yet 59 at grade three would not. How many students were, how many students were we talking about then at Evergreen? Did it end up being? I believe we are projecting right now 59. Nine. Right there, pretty close. So again, it, it, it comes to that guideline number of 22 in second grade, 24 in third grade. And again, these have been in place for some time. Now, we just, the board did review this administrative rule, I want to say within the last two years. Um, but, but for those of you who have been around for a while, I think this has been in place for some time. Um, and so when I say that if, uh, if there would ever be consideration to change, to modify, um, I don't know about a different formula. That might take us some additional thought. But that guideline number, why 23 wasn't used, uh, you can kind of, uh, you can take numbers. Yes, I'm sorry, Lisa. Dr. Carlson. Is there any consideration to one of the um, parents had mentioned concern about this is a group that has some significant needs in the classroom, maybe more than another group of 59 students. At what point is that considered? Because it's not just about the numbers, it's about the level of need in the classroom. Well, it's a factor too, but it also, we look at perhaps um, how we are, if it's, if it's students with um, special education needs, for example, we look at other staffing support as well. So that plays into maybe it's not an additional section or that we might be looking at are there other ways, creative ways, to work with other staffing to provide support. So we might be talking about special education, like identified special education children, but then we could be talking about at-risk students that might sure. not actually sure. be under an IEP sure. or a special education plan. So that, though, that group of at-risk or could potentially Those would all be factors, have correct. issues in the classroom that could, right. and I think they that may not be eligible for extra help in the classroom yes. if they weren't identified. And those would be things that would be identified at this point in time, or would you wait till the fall to do that, or um, as you're making those decisions? 
Well, and as again, part of the report tonight, you don't have, for example, I don't mean to just focus on special education per se, but what you don't have tonight, um, we're still working on the special ed staffing throughout the school district. So that's not part of your report tonight. Um, but I know Ms. Krakow, you know, works with principals and looks at uh, those needs throughout the district. So tonight, again, what you really have at this point in the process is in large part to provide that consistency in the planning is those use, utilization of the guideline along with that formula. Could I, so, could you just talk, I don't wanna keep going too long, but when you said that, um, I know that I probably have this, I know that I have this document, I don't have it with me, but, but you said we follow the guidelines including the formula. So what are the other guidelines besides the formula? numbers uh, the guideline number and then we do when we look at when to add a section we apply that formula I, so there I aren't other have, guidelines it's just the formula let me see if I can if you're all comfortable with just coming up on your monitor yeah. to, I don't know if people in the audience, hopefully you can see that, but so you can start out and we look at, uh, you know, when we consider, and here's some of the things that you've been talking about um, as well, but our work, up, our work up to this point is when we get down here, here's these guidelines that I was talking about, these numbers. And then right here, I will unhighlight this in a moment, it's hard to read, but that is, so at the elementary level, a class will be added when a grade level enrollment in a building exceeds more than half the size of a classroom. And what we're talking about is these guidelines as far as utilizing that number. So the things that are listed above this chart, Dr. Carlson, those yep. items one through six, that's not really what dictates whether we get another section. It's the formula. Is that what you're saying? How much weight the does that have? The number is basically it. <clears throat> and I guess I'm just asking that. Sure. Is it in the back of my head? Um, you know, when I think about special ed there's ed cd ld but there's also esl there's title reading there's title math there's at risk there's our um, gt there's our attention deficit kids that don't have programming and i i just kind of wonder if if that time ever comes when we look at our guidelines because i know it can happen that that there might be a group that has such um such needs that need to be met I think it would be that, that each child the, each little human each little student is just not a number each little student is also defined as what their needs are and and i think that's what i'm hearing some of our teachers mm -hmm. and parents say and i guess that's that's why i'm bringing this up maybe there's a scale like the uh like an fte where where a, a special needs students is counted as 1.5 students or right. 1.4 students. So we don't have those in uh, this numbering system, do we? They're just straight students? They're just... And if it's a special needs student, then they fall to a different category, right? We, we look at what other support, as far as people resources do we have to provide that support. So we look at... Um, again, Ms. Mayor, you went through a list there, mm -hmm. and in many of those areas, we have people that provide support in those areas throughout the district. But so it's that balance of looking at that and plus looking at the sections. But uh, right now, for tonight, what you have in front of you would be with the uh, the board guidelines and the formula. I think what I'm wondering about is the um, 
guidelines, the numerical guidelines are one thing, but it also does say that consideration will be given to these thing, those items up above. above. So I'm wondering where that happens. Someone made a point this evening about the facility, and we know mm -hmm. that okay. the rooms, you know, 30 is the max, but right now those students, if there's, you know, 22 or whatever the number is in each of those classrooms, to add another 10 students in those classrooms is, there's not, I've been in Evergreen, there's not a lot of room in those classrooms. Mm -hmm. And also the, the question is, and I know that this is, it's hard, it's a very hard thing to do, but is 59, we're there right now, but if we have two students come, then that disruption of, well, what if they come, because we see that happen all the time, where they don't come until the first day of school. And then we, that disruption that happens, and I know it's hard, it's like pulling teeth to get people to, to register before the school year starts, but, you know, it just seems like we're going down to two, and then we're gonna possibly go back up again if we get more students, and, the, you know, those ebb and, excuse me, those ebb and flows that we have. And so those issues above the numbers, um, you know, I think initially I, is what you're talking about. That's what we've got to do is look at the numbers and, and forecast. But at some point, will you sit down with your building principals and say, what about these other issues? Can you, you know, are there ways for those to be considered as well? Because I know Evergreen is looking to be one less section this year then. Right. And other schools, so even though staffing is going to stay the same, Evergreen will have actually lose a section, lose a teacher in its building because of this. And then if we, and all that goes with that, switching around our staff, and then we end up with 62 students, it just seems like it's a lot of. I mean, how many sections of third graders are there in Evergreen now? Three. Three. Three, yeah. Three second grade. Yeah. Yeah. Here's gonna go to two. Two. Two, yeah. And that's what I was thinking, it's is only it two, just. Two under two students well, under, you have to have under the requirement. But it does set a precedent because it's not just Evergreen where it's so tight. Right. There are other, dis other district classrooms where mm -hmm. we're seeing that. And so mm -hmm. if we do an exception. So the policy yeah. would be the best. Mm -hmm. I don't think you want to manage each and every, every class and every, and every school. We have to have guidelines. And, and the guidelines aren't met, we have to we have to make a decision. But there's always extenuating circumstances, and we've dealt with extenuating circumstances over the years. And we said, <coughs> "All right, we know what that the rule is. We want another section. Go to another section." Mm -hmm. We've had guidelines before, though, and been within one or two of guidelines and said, well, yeah. "We're gonna we're gonna be proactive and add another section." Mm -hmm. we've Current done policy that. though does not allow for a variation at this point, correct? Yeah. Even with those special other factors involved. The policy as it stands does not allow for a variance. No. I mean, I would hope that the building or the, you know, the district would have, you know, discretion to be able to meet the needs of that school if it, you know, it's needed always to always change that requirement. It's always a problem with metrics. How do you measure what calls for another? This isn't a new issue, though. I mean, this is like, no. you know, you're always weighing needs, numbers, space i mean there's got to be a ranking system beyond just the number of students how to rank and it's I'm not just if we use the a weighted average for some of those students that might be a little dull. yeah and that's really intriguing i think this policy uh, I, as i remember darty berg was part of creating this policy and i think that was before we were doing inclusion in our classroom as much as we are right now and so that that's an intriguing thing that you know, maybe we should be looking at that, but I know there will be a, the, it would be interesting to see what the flip side of financially, what that would be, because it wouldn't just be this one section, it would be district-wide mm -hmm. possible impact, so. That would Behind be. the board also that, that the home and school district has the highest student or teacher to student ratio in the, in the MVC. So it's staff like to t student, staff, yeah. yeah. Staff to student ratio is highest in the conference, so it's not like we're lagging behind. And we discussed about 20 students in a classroom before, and 
But what do you mean by staff? Are you counting yeah, the teachers? Are guidance you talking, counselor? Are you counting yeah. the... Overall, I think the student-to-teacher student, student to teacher ratio is highest in Holman than anywhere in the MBC. I haven't seen that number. Is it? Look. Jay would be the one I would oh. ask, because I know we're up there on yes. students. Teachers. Teachers. Not just staff. Teachers. Right. Just I just want to make sure everybody, the ratio, we would have a very favorable ratio. But again, when we look at specific, we would want to break that down and make sure what are we talking specifically at um, the K-5 regular ed education yeah. classrooms versus other grade levels. So, um, and, and we work through that, but I would say district-wide, if you look at overall our staff, we have a very favorable um, staff to student ratio in comparison. But that doesn't mean that there aren't areas where um, we're not so favorable to grade levels. So then where do we go from here on the, I know the Evergreen issue, we're not voting on anything, it's just discussion tonight, but um, I think you'll continue well, to monitor. Is and it would be, uh, as I mentioned, I don't want to repeat uh, myself over and over, but um, It, if the board would want to consider some modifying to the administrative rule, that would be an option that I certainly could assist with in providing some ideas of what impact that might have. Um, How timely is that kind of process? I mean, is it timely enough to address some of the issues that we brought up tonight? Um, I think that you would hear me say that um, you know, May 12th, I, that's a preferred timeline. I think there are some areas that I have yet to present on where I think the timeliness is perhaps a little bit more important. You'll hear me talk about it at the high school level in just a few minutes. Um, we might be able to um, separate this a little bit if we can move forward. But again, in the past, I've always done one staffing plan. and uh, But we can... Uh, Ms. Mayor, I'm trying to respond to your question uh, while I'm thinking about a timeline and how timely we can turn around. I was asking more like how long you think it would typically take when we look at guidelines. So if we, if we looked at, at um, Gary's suggestion or other suggestions, you know, weighted students, to change a policy, does that start in SALC? Does that, is that where it would have to start? And we have just one meeting left for this year. So where I'm going with this is trying to figure out how long that might take if that was something we wanted to do. And then would it be in effect and could it address the situation that we're specifically looking at at Evergreen? Well, ultimately, these are your policies. Correct. And, and we do, you're right, we do have a very, uh, we have a process that involves our stakeholders through our committee level and so on. Um, if, you, if, if you want to make some modifications even to that process or special meeting or there are ways to, you can accelerate this. Um, I think that <clears throat> this is, no matter what is set uh, on May 12th or in the coming weeks, there's still that possibility that as we get into June or July, we still may come back to the board and say we need an additional section here. We, we need to move this from here to here. So um, I don't want anybody to think that, you know, just a modification of the board policy just by doing that in itself is going to make everything go away. Um, there'll be still issues, but if you want to work through that, consider some changes as it's up to you how fast you want to accelerate this through the process. If you want to make an exception to the process of committee and so on, that would be up to you. So those are our options. I think that um, we have nothing that we we can vote on tonight on this, but we certainly could come to a consensus. Um, Kate indicated there's only one more meeting of the Student Achievement and Learning Committee. Um, I certainly think we should 
have some data. We keep saying we're a data-driven um, district. We make decisions based on data, so we'd probably want to look at some data first. Um, and then, I don't know what process would you like to follow to take a deeper look at this? <coughs> I would just like to be able to know if there's a ranking system out there for students to look at those factors above because it mentions it as another way of assessing the situation, but it doesn't, the policy doesn't allow it to happen. Yeah. So I would want to know, we're not talking, not, not special education kids that have assistive staff because we already know that that piece is covered, but it's those other kids that don't have staff designated time because we all know that they exist and it can really um, cause a challenge in the classroom. We could try to provide more information as I look out to some of my people I would depend on on some of those other support systems through staffing, uh, our ESL staff title, so on. I mean, we can do, if that helps in any way, we could provide that information. Not, like you said, Ms. Collins, not just special education, but. Um, would it be possible to include those stakeholders, um, the parents who spoke Mm -hmm. to us in I know that we saw the the communication that you shared related to their the ones that spoke at the last meeting thanking them for coming but um, if you could share more of that data with the people who came forward and spoke to us I think that might be helpful too to so for them to see the the numbers and the just how it's district wide even the numbers that you know evergreen isn't the only dis school that's faced with these issues and I think information is important so I'm going to ask for um, privilege of the um, the president I someone in the audience is raising her hand and it's not our practice to have yep yep it's not our practice but if okay. the board would allow me to open it up for one quite is it a question or a comment yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really not our practice to do that, but we certainly. Would the bo board give permission for one statement or comment? Would sure. that be okay? Yeah. Yep. Sure. Bring it on. Yep. Okay. One statement, so you guys can figure out who's going to speak. <laughs> okay. You were talking about. Would you? I guess the best thing to do, yes, yes. is have you. And that's for the people who may be watching at home or may watch the YouTube. Um, you can see our board meetings on YouTube. There's a Jan Wee can tell you what the address. Yeah. Do I have to go through all that again? Yes. No, if you just want to. Okay. You were talking about making an exception. And uh, our current second grade is two sections. Next year you would pass, or three, three sections, yeah. I'm sorry. Next year you would go to two sections. The following year, you would have to come back to three sections. We've, we've done our research with the numbers. At this point, our third grade class would be the highest third grade class in our district. I made that phone call as well. Um, exceptions that I would like to bring to your attention when you say these are guidelines, these are numbers, we have kids, they're human beings. They're, each individual kid has their each individual need that is summed up into 30 students. And my example of that is, right now in fourth grade, we have zero wheelchairs, zero. Right now in our third grade class, we have three. Or I'm sorry, I can't even keep my grade straight anymore. <laughs> <laughs> our current second grade, next year's third grade, we will have three wheelchairs. Our current fourth grade, I can speak for that because I have a fourth grader, we have zero wheelchairs. So when we say make, um, make a change for one year, you know, can we, I mean, I think we have to take that into consideration. One year we have zero wheelchairs, the next year we have three. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and I guess just to, Dr. Carlson, isn't the number 24 for next year also for fourth grade? Correct. So unless we had added students, we wouldn't go to three sections. 
You know what the fourth grade yeah. was. But you, because you said next numbers? this year and numbers. third grade, it would can, be. I'd like to follow up because. Okay, if you want, I wrote respond. that down. Yeah. We have fifty-nine going to third this year. So we'd have two sections. Year, we have fifty-nine going into fourth grade. We'd only have two sections as well. Um, but I think the numbers that we have behind third. us, the you would max out of your thirty students. So you would have your third like grade class coming up behind you. Yes. yes sure. So you were saying oh, okay. your okay. your even flow. Yeah, your, your, right. So this year you're this. This year you're this. This year this. You would be going back and forth. You would be right. going three sections, two sections, three sections. Right. right. And that was a, that was the point I was trying to make too. Was that? So thank I could you. be wrong. Don't mark my no, words. No, no, no. I thank you. I I was thinking of this class moving. Yeah. So, so thank you. You're talking about grade the grade level. Okay. So once this class moves into third grade and goes to two sections, unless additional students came, they would continue in those two sections. Right. Right. And the class behind them would be three sections. Because of the numbers of students. Which probably happens in a growing district, I would think. I have more to my report. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I, I've taken some notes and, and if, if uh, we still need to work on some clarification, I can. So, but would you, you would see to it that those folks would get the information that? Yes, okay. yes, we can work out some scenarios, provide some things, how things are, yeah, got it. Still at the elementary level, I did want to make a note that um, the kindergarten projections, next to 4K, kindergarten is the next, most difficult to project. So um, don't be surprised if uh, some changes may come your way just as we get farther into May and we continue to have enrollment in the, at the kindergarten level. Those are probably more tentative numbers than any, any of the other projections at this time. At the middle school, staffing levels at this point would remain the same. However, I would say attention continues to be given to some specific areas, including some of the elective areas, such as art, world language, music, and so on, as well as some of the core student enrollments. I, last year, and I'm looking at Mr. Vogler, he, I didn't prep him for this, but I think it was at this time or even a little bit later, we experienced a year ago some changes with our math enrollment and looking for some ways and I think I came to you and we we increased um, some uh, math uh, a section or so that's still there's a possibility but I think uh, again right now we're looking at pretty close to status quo uh, at this time for the middle school The high school staffing plan includes in, uh, increases in about five areas and decrease in one area <coughs> for a total FTE, a full-time employment change of about 1.76. So before I go any further, what this is intended to, to uh, say to you is more of a budget impact, not a physical person impact when you see a, something like 1.76. And I'll go into that a little bit further. You will also uh, note that something new, and I'll try to explain this, on the supervision, I simply make a note of a supervision contingency of about 0.25 FT, and, and I will get to that. Uh, well, let me just talk a little bit about that now. There are times when teachers are assigned supervision as part of their teaching assignment, especially at the high school level. This may, it doesn't happen very often, but this sometimes occurs when we may have a slight reduction from one year to the next in a specific curriculum area. We've had a long-standing practice of not making partial staffing reductions and increases based on one year 
of student enrollment and subject selection unless it can be done without impacting a person. For example, in the case of French for next year, we are experiencing a partial reduction in the number of class sections based on student selection. However, due, due to a dual licensure, we are able to utilize a staff member in another department that is experiencing an increase <coughs> enrollment. In addition, we would have staff assigned to additional supervision, for example, study halls. By doing this, we do not have to react to a one-year reduction and avoid the annual up and down in staffing where some districts get into the annual non-renewing of staff. I would also say that we take the specific position into account as well. If it is a position that is difficult to fill or replace, then I believe it is in our best interest to try to retain the individual until we know if the enrollment change of one year will continue or not. If we have two years of reduction or increase, then we would perhaps move towards making a staffing level change in a, for example, a layoff, a non-renewal, or an addition. I would say to you the plan that is in front of you, a couple of these areas, family and consumer education, we've had, um, Mr. Bear, a couple of years now of greater student interest than what we have staffed for. So in other words, we have, for a couple of years, we have said to students that we do not have uh, uh, everything in family and consumer ed is full. We've had a couple of years of that. And so what I am supporting or recommending is that we do address that area in family and consumer ed by um, increasing our staffing in that area. Our philosophy at the high school level has been to staff according to what our students select. We know we can't do this 100%, but we do believe it is important. As a result, you will have a fluctuation from year to year, that up and down. We wanted to smooth that fluctuation with our staffing as much as possible, but also be fiscally responsible as well. I still have a, a few more things to cover, but I guess I would like to um, stop it and just try to respond to some questions regarding the high school staffing proposal in front of you. And I may have to lean on Mr. Bear if needed. Are there questions? I, I have a couple, and I don't know if this is the time for them. But, and it really kind of ties to the earlier discussion with the elementary as well. Um, and, and it could you could tell me it's an apples to oranges comparison, <clears throat> um, but the teacher to student ratio at the high school I know there's a lot more segments. How does that compare? And I know the class size is, is smaller at the elementary, but is our teacher to student ratio smaller at the elementary as well, or is it at the high school? Because I'm wondering if we have a lot of electives that maybe do not have a large number in that all of a sudden our teacher to student ratio is different at one than another and you know that may tie back to the earlier conversation as well and and just take a look at that because you know it, it's it's interesting and it, as I listen and I haven't said a lot because it's it is a very difficult conversation I'm just trying to listen to it all but you know it, it, it kind of makes me smile in a way and feel good about Holman and that we're having conversations like this as opposed to many school districts are having the other end which is cutting teachers and cutting staff and, and it, it makes you feel good we're not in that position but it does come with its own with its own challenges and I guess that's where we, we certainly want to look at how do we best serve the students um, and that's that's what makes this difficult so you know, we're, we're on one hand having a really difficult conversation about the number of teachers at an elementary, and now we're adding 1.76 at the high school. And I'm not saying I'm opposed to either of those. I just, right. I'm feeling I just, I need a little more data in order to make that determination. And, and I know you're going to get to the, but as long as I've kind of got the floor here, I know you're going to get to the cost of this. Um, right. I'm also a little bit concerned that 
and, and I think I read in your memo, and maybe this has changed, that at this point we don't have a plan for how we're going to pay for that yet. And now if you're are you willing to just hold on to that? I will. I just thought I'd get that out there. Yes, thank you. Well, I know that we've had conversations um, and discussions about the high school, and I think <coughs> as a board we've discussed that, you know, where there's a lot of additions here, even though it's not one additional teacher, different percentages, additional um, options. We don't, we see that decrease in French and that, you know, in some schools I know you see the Spanish where it's a half and you see the addition of the French, you would just direct those students to take French instead of Spanish and I just don't know that that's necessarily an option we want to talk about but um, we also, I think you've made us aware of concerns about that lower end where we only have 12 students or nine students in a class and in some cases if it's the AP classes we found it to be cost effective for us to keep those students and keep those classes here. But I think as Tim mentioned, the extra um, classes that we have, um, you know, are we seeing those low? Do we have a process for those where we would see reductions in those areas? Um, and then the second, you know, I'm just remembering family and consumer ed when she came and presented to us the curriculum, the new additional classes, we accepted those and approved those with the understanding that there wouldn't be increased costs, that we would, you know, and now we're seeing, in reality, a, an increased cost because of student interest. And so that question is at the high school level, and I don't know if Bob is ready to speak to that, or maybe you, he could <laughs> share information. You know, how are those things done then on the other side to make those reductions before those things are offered to students or do we just throw everything out there and let them you know whatever sticks sticks and then we try to offer those classes or is there a process for looking at those reductions hold me accountable to make sure i respond to a couple of these here um the low there is, uh, and Mr. Bear and I, we've talked about this uh, for some time, and, and this has been brought to the board's at least acknowledgement or awareness. There is currently not in your class size average or board policy or administrative rule specific language about minimum class sizes at the high school. In other words, as Mr. Bear works with his staff after students go through their subject selection, there is not a in the board policy a guideline for Mr. Bear to use that we must have this number of students enroll or choose a class in order to run the course. I would say unofficially we, we continue to work through that and Mr. Bear has done a great job of being very sensitive to that but also balancing that with what we have felt as a district is important especially with some of our vocational areas, our elective areas. And so you need to balance that. But that, again, I don't have the data tonight. We'll work on that, how we differ. You wanted the comparison between high school and elementary. I would even say we can, I think it would be important to see between our core areas and our elective areas. And I'm, I, I'm not going to say this officially, but just the nature of high school scheduling and the number of sections you offer, it wouldn't be surprising, I'm looking at Mr. Bear, to see that there might be a lower class size average when you look at some of our elective areas. But, some, but that, again, I want to balance that with, we've had a commitment and a belief that those areas are important as well. So um, again, making saying that publicly, I don't want people to think that that um, there's it, that our any of our areas are viewed differently by this school district. Um, so there is nothing in place right now. We we look at it each situation independently of another to come up with. Is it appropriate to run a section or not? The other thing with the high school scheduling is just because you have a certain number of students that select a course in February, 
what happens is Mr. Baird does make some decisions on we clearly don't have enough students to run this course. I'm going, ahead, I'm going to go ahead and cancel the course so we then, our counselors, our staff can work with those students to get them back into other courses and we see what the impact then has before we get too far down the scheduling. But the reality is once that done is done and students, you start scheduling, you're going to run the computer, you're going to run into conflicts. And so then our counselors and staff work through those. We probably do multiple runs, I can assume, uh, trying to lower the number of conflicts. Why I say all that is from the time in February when students select their courses to the time September 1 comes around, it looks different as far as how many, how many students are in the classroom. It can look different. And not only that, but as the school year starts from term one to term two, changes can be made too. We do the best we can with the information we have. We do look, I, Mr. Bear knows this, that I, we talk about trends from one year to the next, looking back multiple years and try to learn the best, what, what some of the trend of information is. Family and consumer ed, um, any time when a department presents perhaps a new course offering, as Mrs. Hancock said, there is that, that this will not result in an increased cost. Well, I, I'll say this, my, my belief of that is just the board saying yes to this course doesn't in itself result in increased cost. I believe added to that is said, it's all driven by student selection. If this new course results in more students signing up, that's one of the purposes for that. When we add a course like that, so there may be four current courses, now we're adding a fifth. Is there a process, and this isn't for you to answer tonight, maybe Mr. Bear can respond. Is there a process then to say, we will still continue to offer four, but this one will eliminate this one. And is it by trends? You mentioned trends. I wrote that down. Is that what determines it? or Because that would be good to know when, when you bring those new courses to us, if you've got already four courses that are very popular and this new one is going to add a section or add a class to us versus maybe we've offered four courses but one of them really hasn't had student enrollment in it and so we're offering this one to pique their interest and we'll eliminate course number one and so though I think that certainly can happen absolutely are, are you asking student feedback prior to selecting sections to find out what like out of four class options they'd be most likely to or would want to pursue this course I mean do you ask them or how do you select those options that you're offering the how do students select their course for the coming year I'm sorry no, how do you, how does the district decide which ones to offer do you ask okay. the students sure. like, do you and do a polling kind of thing or we work through mr. bear or even Ms. Savaski we work through you know that you have sometimes it comes after a department Curriculum area has done a review, an examination of of their of that curriculum area, and so out of that, um, there'll be a presentation to the board as far as new courses. So I think usually November, December, we have come to the board with new course proposals. I was so, just thinking, like if it's towards what students want and they ultimately get to choose and that dictates what sections you run how do you are they do they have input into the ones that are that are offered, offered. For them to take yeah I, hopefully i understand your question if i'm not answering it correctly just just let me know but every year what happens is the students get 
all the different grade levels, they get a sheet with all of the courses possible that they can take. Okay. And then they, when they go through the registration process, they sign up for the courses that will give them eight credits throughout the year. And in addition mm -hmm. to those eight credits, they also put down two alternates. And then we put that information into the computer and we see how many requests are okay. for okay. certain courses. Okay. And that's where we come up with um, which, are the mo which are the courses that we need to offer by student selection. Um, and of course, the required courses take precedence and then, then the elective courses. And for whatever reason, I, I, I have some information, but we had more requests in every curriculum area this year than in the previous year. So as we went through and looked at all the information, every curriculum area this, for this upcoming year had more requests than the previous year in all curriculum areas. And then and I don't want you to think that every course that they ask for gets offered.